Welcome to this episode of Safe Home Podcast for struggling teens and their families finding their healing path. This episode is sponsored by Beth Hansen and Lori Hansen. Thank you so much, you two. I'm Beth Syverson, a mom of an 18 year old son, Joey, who's been dealing with addiction and mental health issues for several years. I'm walking beside him as he struggles with his recovery while I work on my own personal growth and healing. Now, out of all the guests we've had on Safe Home Podcast, today's guest is someone I've known the longest. I've even known her longer than my wife. (laughs) Taylor Cox is 19 years old, about six months older than Joey, and I've taught her piano since she was about seven. And the two of them, Joey and Taylor, have grown up together. Taylor is a very talented musician. She can play any song on the piano after she hears it just once. And she writes her own music, she learns complicated classical songs, and she went to an arts conservatory high school. She excelled in all areas at school and was active in her church as well. She's an all-around great student. Oh, and by the way, she was born completely blind. When Taylor graduated high school in June 2021, she went away to a special school for blind people to teach them to live independently. Things like cooking, cleaning, navigating the streets, etc., She's had a few bumps in the road during her transition beyond high school and beyond home, and she's willing to talk about it with our safe home families to help other teens who are dealing with similarly tough transitions. Taylor knows, I think, the world of her, and the fact that she's willing to be open about her challenges earns her even more gold stars in my book. (laughs) Now, listeners, make sure to stay until the end because we'll be playing one of her own songs at the end of this episode. I'm so grateful you're here to tell your story, Taylor. Welcome to Safe Home. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's an honor. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm honored that you're willing to talk about your story here. So mm-hmm. thank you. First, why don't you tell us about what you remember about your early days of playing the piano? How old were you when you started? Did you realize that music was a gift right away? What was that like when you were really little? When I first started, I, I didn't really realize how much music really meant to me. I think mom was like, you get to start piano. And I remember being so excited. I think we went to a Catholic service or something for a cousin. And there was a piano player there that was just playing beautiful music. And I think I told my mom even, I was like, I want to do that. So I always loved music and playing, practicing was always, always a little bit of a struggle for me. Had a, a tough time sitting still, but I think as I started to grow older, I started to realize, okay, this is definitely a gift. And I'm so glad that Beth walked alongside me. And so, yeah. Yeah. You remind me so much of myself because I also kind of was born with some talent that, you know, I didn't really earn. It, it just plop, plopped into <laughs> our laps, right? It did. And it, I think I can really relate to you because I also was not a super great practicer. Still, no. I'm not because so many things just come easy. But you've really pushed yourself, especially in the last couple of years, to learn really tough things like a Joplin rag and Moonlight Sonata, and Chopin Nocturne, and really push yourself beyond just what your natural talent can give you. You've had to dig in and, and do the stuff which you've been doing. So it's great. Yeah, thank you. It was, yeah. I remember learning that rag and being like, I hate life right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough when, when you're right in that trenches, it's like, oh, this is no fun. But when you get to the other side, you're like, oh, this is great. Now I have this piece forever under my fingers and you feel so proud of yourself. And like you did that, you know? Yeah, I did. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. good. Good life lessons that you can get in piano too. But well, music's been such a big part of your life. I can't I can't imagine what your life would be without your music, but I know you do lots of other things. What are some of your other interests? I love to read. <laughs> I am in college right now. I am taking a communications class at Orange Coast College. Love hanging out with my friends, love just discovering new things, love technology, love things like that. So Yeah, you're really good at technology. You work for a technology company for the visually impaired, right? Yeah, I did over the summer. I did two summers in a row. So the summer of 2020, when we couldn't do anything anyways, um, I was able to just sit back and work 
Um, I got to work from home. I got to work with their outreach team. And you help refine their products or help sell them or what? Kind of help make sure that some of the webinars were still up to date. Some of the training materials were still up to date, just stuff like that. Oh, okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. So you tested it, tested it out for them. I did. Yeah. That's awesome. And I know you've presented at different conferences and things, the latest technology. Yeah. So when I was 12, my teacher mentioned to me, there's a kid that was just here in San Francisco that presented. And I was like, okay, I want to do that. Yeah. (laughs) Taylor's not shy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she's she's great. And, and and you you should see Taylor work her phone or a computer and it talks to her so fast. Blah, 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 blah. Um that's how she gets around. It's so amazing to watch. And then uh, Taylor's very very fluent in braille as well and her fingers just fly <laughs> across the page. I just it boggles my mind. I don't know how you do that, but it's pretty awesome. You know, I ha- I don't know if I've ever told you this. I've had people tell me, well, how do blind people play the piano? And I'm like, well, that's the easiest instrument to play if you're blind because it's like giant braille, right? The black keys stick right up. It's easy to feel them, right? It is. Yeah. And even sighted people, like when I have my right hand up on the high notes and left hand on the low notes, I can't see both at the same time. So I'm using my tactile senses as well as a sighted person. So you just have to use it completely without any of the visuals, but you've managed yourself so well on the piano. It really, really Mm -hmm. suits you well. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's been really fun to learn with you and you just have been such a great teacher. Oh, thank you. And what I love about your family is that they've never put limits on you. No. From when you were little, I remember when we, I first got you as a student and your mom would be like, I just let her fall on the playground or you know I I don't like coddle her or make sure she's always protected she just has to go figure out where her her limits are herself and Mm -hmm. I think that's been really great have you felt that energy from your family yeah for sure definitely and they've been a great great source of support I know people who have had to fight for their right I guess to go off even to living school for the blind where there's a lot to learn and they still have to fight for it you mean from their family yeah uh-huh. their family doesn't want them to go off to learn to be independent yeah oh. mm-hmm. wow what are what are some of the things that people have told you oh blind people can't do x and then you prove them wrong definitely walking across the street traveling by yourself living by yourself you were telling me the other day you were doing archery. Yeah. Kind of terrifies <laughs> me, but I'm sure that people are making sure you're pointing in the right direction. Yeah, they definitely do. I did it once. I did it with my uncle. Then I did it with actually like a blind camp. They call it Camp Bloomfield and they have archery there. It's not my favorite mm-hmm. sport because you need arm strength, which I don't really have. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> um yeah and then yeah they make sure you point at the right place but oh good good, good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've learned so much watching you grow up and so much about not putting limits on people and asking how can this be more accessible or and you are not the kind of person that gets offended sometimes I ask stupid questions I know but you're you're always very gracious in just answering what what it is for you, right? Yeah. So kind of helping educate everybody. So would you rather people ask you questions or you know, or do you feel self-conscious when people ask you, you know, how how does it feel to be blind? Or you know, do you hate that kind of stuff? Or no, is it okay? I don't. I I mean, I see it as if you don't ask, you're never gonna learn. So like why not? Mm-hmm. Why not ask the question? Mm-hmm. Why not be the one to ask the stupid question or the dumb question? Because it's usually something that everyone else is thinking. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, one thing I always, I, I used to always feel so self-conscious, like if I accidentally would say, well, did you see a show on TV or something? And But you said mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. You You know what we're saying. And it doesn't like sting you or something if we accidentally say a visual word definitely not I remember someone 
I think why people were joking about this, I still don't know if it was joke or like if they were actually like being serious, but I remember like as a kid, someone was like, do you, this was another blind person and there was a TV show called Austin and Ally, and they're like, do you watch Austin and Ally? And then they're like, no, do you listen to Austin and Ally? And they were, I think they were totally joking, but I remember being like, I've never heard that before and I will never use that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet other sighted people have changed it because they felt bad, you know, like, oh, oh, I don't want to rub it in that you can't mm-hmm. see it, but it doesn't make you feel bad. Not at all. You watch it just in a, you know, slightly different way. Right? Yeah, that's another good topic is growing accessibility, especially with Disney and Netflix and stuff like that. They have what's called audio description. And so I watch mm-hmm. everything with that. and. I can watch Breaking Bad or Stranger Things just like you guys can. I just have a voice kind of telling me what's going on. And so. So it's a special mm-hmm. setting, right? And then it will tell you, and now the guy is walking into the door and it's dark mm-hmm. and da 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 da. Right. They, they kind of describe it. And they have that for theater too, right? Yeah. Live theater. It's, it's very helpful, right? It makes it feel more of an experience because just the dialogue is not the whole. There's more to it than the dialogue that you're missing when you can't you know, just the dialogue is not enough to tell the story, right? Yeah, for sure. I remember watching a show and not knowing how to turn on the audio description. And I was like, what's going on? And then I remember watching it back like a year later when I had figured out how to turn on audio description. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much more different and just so much more inclusive. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So if any of our listeners have a blind person in their life, maybe they're a teacher or a therapist or I don't know, whatever, or their their kid has a friend who's a blind student or whatever. What would be your best advice for them to make sure blind people feel included but not singled mm-hmm. out, to make you feel accepted and just part of the part of the group? What what would be your best advice? Talk to them like they're regular people, because we are. We just yeah. don't have eyesight. Yeah. And I think anyone with a with a disability, I can't speak for everyone, but I feel like we really do want to belong. We want to fit in. Mm-hmm. I think just talking to us like regular people and having conversations with us and asking, like, I know you're going to have curiosity, like ask the questions if you want to, but think of us not as someone with a disability, just think of mm-hmm. like a regular person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you have way more to you than just that you're blind. Yeah, exactly. It's just like a yeah. little footnote. There's mm-hmm. so much more, right? So, I mean, certainly it does affect you day to day, but it there's so much more that we can talk about than being blind. So let's talk mm-hmm. about some other stuff. <laughs> How was your experience at APA, Academy of Performing Arts at Huntington yeah. Beach High School? How was that experience for you? It was amazing. People were great. I still keep in touch with some of the people that I was in high school with through that program. And I definitely feel like I've made friends for life with them. I feel like a lot of them taught me, like, I feel like I taught them about empathy, but I I feel like I felt it from others too. And yeah, it was just, I remember even hanging out with people outside of school like being like hey you want to go to Panera or like talking about like stupid stuff like The Bachelor and just being like oh my gosh I have friends (laughs) yay was that the first time where you really felt you were fitting in it was when you went to the uh, performing arts high school yeah definitely and what surprised me too is even people who I thought wouldn't really say hi to me like because I thought they were cool or whatever like they would Mm -hmm. And it definitely okay. made a difference to me, especially. Yeah. Musicians tend to be, you know, I think they're a, a different breed uh, quite mm-hmm. a bit than just regular people. Uh, you know, the artist types, they tend to be a little bit more empathetic, although sometimes it can be kind of toxic, depends on mm-hmm. what's going on. But yeah, art, artists are usually, you know, very open and accepting. Mm-hmm. So, yay. That was so exciting having you uh, had that opportunity at that school because you were basically in like a rock music I was, program. Yeah. It was so fun. I loved going to your concerts to half of them got knocked mm-hmm. out because of COVID. Dang yeah. it. But, but it was so fun. And you got to feature your own music, your own originals. And then you did mm-hmm. cover songs. 
What was like a, a highlight for you from your high school? Oh man. Um, I think my favorite song that I ever sang was even actually before my own original was Let It Be by the Beatles. Yeah, I remember that one. It was a whole Beatles concert, right? Yeah, they they usually do. They do Let It Be. It depends. They were doing the White Album, I think, in Abbey Road, that whole thing. So that was really fun. And Beatles was always one of my favorite shows that we did. <laughs> nice. And then they they really featured your originals and you made a whole music video and did a whole bunch yeah. of stuff with with your originals. That was really great. You are a really wonderful composer. You you've been getting awards since you were really little with the what do they call it? Mm-hmm. The reflections, the PTA reflections yeah. contest. I think did you get it every year? Every year you got some sort of prize from that for your compositions. Yeah. Right? Um most years. I think there was like one year where I didn't. <laughs> but no two. Oh really? And then but they were both kind of just just not great pieces. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then mm-hmm. that makes sense. Well, you've had some really great successes and even from a really young age you've been really good composer and you write really beautiful poetry and for your lyrics and just so inventive. We play a game at our lessons. I call it the genre game and I'll pick a song or Taylor will pick a song and I'll tell her to play it in a certain genre to kind of mix it up a bit. So your improv skills are amazing Mm -hmm. and just you're quirky and fun and it's so fun working with you. you. (laughs) Now, um, when your high school got messed up, like everybody's did Mm -hmm. because of COVID at one point you got accepted into ASU, right? Arizona state Mm -hmm. to go into music therapy. And then what, what happened with that? Well, my dream school was Northridge, Cal State Northridge, but unfortunately it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Really sucked. Um, kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, they say, I don't know, that mm-hmm. I think was my first heartbreak because it was like I fell in love with the school, I guess mm-hmm. you could say, mm-hmm. but didn't like me. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember that audition. Um, playing the rag and I think I was on I remember my mom being like hey you look like you're gonna faint are you okay <laughs> oh my gosh were you having a panic attack during that know. audition like I think I was going to mm. but I I was able to kind of bring it back a little bit mm. and then I had an easier piece the second time around mm-hmm. but I couldn't talk I felt like my mouth had just frozen Okay. Okay. So you think your audition, if it would have gone better, you might have gotten into the school, but maybe you just, it wasn't your best audition interview yeah, kind of thing. Maybe, but also I know, I also know too, that they were looking for like volunteers, more volunteer hours for me and they wanted guitar. Oh. So. Oh, they wanted you to already know guitar. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. Because a lot of music therapists, they'll play with a guitar or an ukulele or something in their lap and be portable. Mm -hmm. They would have rather you already had known guitar. So they wouldn't have had to teach you. I wonder if they were not as accessible because I know ASU was very amenable to your uh, disability. But I wonder if Northridge would have been. Yeah. Then maybe they didn't know what to do with you. Yeah. And ASU too. One thing that really, really, really worked in my advantage was I was able to send in a video. Ah, instead of a live audition. Yeah. So I could do it however I wanted, whenever I wanted, and when I was feeling really good. And over and over and over until you got it. Yeah. and (laughs) Until you got it the way you wanted. Yeah. I still have that video. Yeah. And I think it was the best I think I've ever played that song. (laughs) Yeah. We can link that in the notes too if people want to see it. Mm -hmm. Now, so you got into ASU. Mm -hmm. Yay. And they had actually other blind students in their music therapy program. So they knew how to do that. You Mm -hmm. know, the accessibility piece, which was a bonus. And then uh, why did you not end up going there? I feel like... Well, the out-of-state tuition right now is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have been really hard to go. Mm-hmm. I also think, too, like one thing that I knew was I think I thought I was ready, but I wasn't really, and I needed to get more skills, more mm-hmm. living skills. So Yeah. Yeah. 
So you pivoted, I pivoted and you went to independent living school. So it's particularly for blind people to just get out of the house because you've been at your house forever and you know everything in your house, right? Mm-hmm. So you're kind of in your comfort zone, but not everything is going to be in your house. And so for, for you to be able to go, if you want to go to ASU later, to be able to live in a dorm, you know, on your own, you need to have these certain skills that they're teaching you. Mm-hmm at the independent living school. How did that go when you first made that transition? It was like in the fall, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How'd that go? It was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> what all happened? So I was with a lot of teenagers and yeah. teenagers that were not really supervised. I mean, we're, we're 18. We don't really need that, but there was just like a lot of just boredness. There was a lot of downtime. <sighs> Yeah, I think from what I heard from your mom telling me before you went, it sounded like this program that was going to shepherd you around and you'd have a one-on-one aid for like eight hours a day. And it was this thing where everyone would be kind of in this protected space, but still learning to be independent. But it turned out nothing like that. Yeah. It was like a free for all. Yeah, it was. I knew there wouldn't be an aid, but I also knew that I thought I wouldn't be completely alone. But I started learning more from the other students than I was from the teachers. (laughs) Oh, great. Mm -hmm. That's what you guys do. I know everywhere Joey's gone, he's learned from everyone else, which is sort of terrifying. Yeah. Depending on who you're (laughs) with, right? Gosh. Yeah, for sure. So did you get into trouble? Did you make some bonehead teenage choices? I did. (laughs) Yeah. You tell us anything you want to tell us about that. Mm. Or you can just say that you made bonehead choices and that's enough. What I will say about it was it felt like to me, I feel like I grew up quite a bit like there was no substances anywhere, nothing, nothing big. Um, Mm. And then you've got all this stuff on the table now. You've got, if you want it, you've got drinks, you've got marijuana you got all this stuff on the table sitting ready for you to try it so all these blind kids had access to all these substances is that what you're telling me pretty much i didn't do a lot i didn't do you know i was smart with it Mm -hmm. but there were still times where they were like hey uh we've got this do you want to try it and i was like yeah (laughs) yeah because you're 18 and you try stuff yeah that's what people do Now, okay, this is sort of terrifying. Okay, so these substances that kids are getting are are pretty dangerous because you never know what's in them. But when you're also blind, you really, really don't know what you're getting. Like you don't know what you're drinking out of what bottle. I mean, how do you guys know what you're doing? Some of them had a little bit of vision so they could see a little bit what was happening. Mm -hmm. And we share like they would share a little bit but like they mostly kept their stuff on them so they knew what was what. okay okay gotcha okay mm-hmm. well that's good it's very scary out there with fentanyl and everything involved you mm-hmm. know everything can be laced and so just be careful yeah. out there okay so you kind of did the whole i just got out on my own i'm going bananas kind of thing which is i'm pretty sure extremely common <laughs> And yeah. how did that work for you? How did you do it school? And, you know, how, how did that impact you? It was awful. I had never really struggled with depression. And here I was. I, I know that even you saw a change in mm-hmm. me. I wasn't motivated to do anything. Mm-hmm. I was just sleeping through each day, trying to get through each day like that. And then... I feel like I'd had panic attacks before. Like there was one day after a second round of ASU and Cal State Northridge interviews, like this the Monday or Tuesday before, where I full on had a meltdown and Mm -hmm. started crying and I felt nauseous and felt like I was gonna throw up. So I think Mm -hmm. that was definitely a panic attack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But nothing, nothing like what I was experiencing there. It was, okay. it wasn't constant. I had like two that I clearly remember, mm. but there was other stuff, like other people were struggling. Mm. And sometimes at those schools, there's just an undertone of desperation and sadness. 
Yeah, it sounds like that first school that you went to was just kind of just toxic all around. Yeah, and I started to talk more about mental health. Mm -hmm. Thinking back on it, I started to open up with the living skills teacher. I'm like, how is your, you know, like mental health? Like, what was it like living there, like being blind and stuff? And I wanted to talk about it. And I think looking back, I was looking for validation. Like, I'm feeling this Ah. way. Like, is this normal? (laughs) without even saying oh, it yeah you were looking for help yeah and did someone say well you know what we have this resource right over here to help you or was there any help available for you there if you wanted it they could help you with therapy they could help mm-hmm. you find a therapist mm-hmm. but one thing that I started to realize even at the second school I, I did switch schools and mm-hmm. it's been a struggle but it's been better yeah One thing I did start to notice is like there's a really big need for therapy in these kind of environments, like a blind therapist talking to people who have just lost their sight or things like that. But the state won't grant it. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's so hard. I, I, we, you know, with Joey, we've run into so many obstacles to get him the mental health he needs. It's so frustrating, but I, I would guess that students Blind or not, it, it, your this transition period from high school into whatever else is so tricky to navigate. Like, I just think 100% of people in your situation should be in therapy. Yeah. You know? Just just give it out like candy. Mm-hmm. Everybody gets therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a hard transition. You know, you're trying to be all, all alone. You know, there's all sorts of things that might get pulled up around that. And mm-hmm. just trying to navigate friendships and a new place and then you add your disability on top of it oh my gosh so did you end up getting therapy and and did it help I did I did get therapy after coming home and basically crying to my mom being like mom I made really bad decisions and I didn't tell her right away and everything and she said you know my love for you doesn't change but we definitely need to get you help we need to get you Mm -hmm. counseling and I said Mm -hmm. ah Okay. (laughs) Were you not excited about counseling at that point? What actually helped me was talking to people who in the family who had gotten it. Like one of my really close family members was like, I'm going to therapy. And I was like, why would you do that? Like you're you're doing (laughs) fine, right? And and they were like, yeah, yeah, I'm doing fine. Because I've been going to therapy. (laughs) Yeah, but I felt like there's kind of like this stigma for asking for help. Like, I don't Mm -hmm. like asking for help. It's just like something I don't like to do. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was fine, but I didn't really realize how messed up my mind was. Yeah, it happens so slowly. Sometimes you just kind of start coping with things. I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess this is just my reality. But yeah, once you get in therapy, you're like, yeah, I was carrying around a lot, Mm -hmm. right? Is that how you felt when you finally found your therapist? Yeah. And did it help you once you got into therapy, or did you have to try to find a few therapists till you found one that clicked? Or um, what I did was I I looked on a website and they had her bio, Mm -hmm. and I really liked her and. I liked her bio. I liked that she was younger. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I think I like that. And I still talk to her actually over the phone. Telehealth has been amazing. That's one thing we learned in COVID is you can do telehealth for counseling Mm -hmm. if you have to. I mean, it's so great because wherever you are and now you're back far away, you can still be in therapy with the same person. Mm -hmm. That's pretty great. What are some of the tools that your therapist taught you to maintain your stability and your grounding? Definitely taking a second to just breathe, think about it and Mm -hmm. be like, okay. One thing that she taught me, they call it five, four, three, two, one for you guys. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things Mm -hmm. you can feel, two to smell and one to taste. Yeah. So Uh I've done that a lot. But you can skip the five. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so you decide, go four, three, two, one. Yeah. I think that's a great exercise. We've done that a lot with Joey. It helps you bring yourself into your own body again, mm-hmm. into your senses and out of your out of your mind, which is trying to pull you away sometimes, you know? Yeah. So it pulls you right back into this present moment. Yeah. And not even honestly, like listening to everyone, too. I remember... I was gone. I had I had a panic attack outside of the the school's dorms. Mm-hmm. 
Then I went back to the dorms and I told a counselor, the dorm counselor Mm -hmm. there. And Mm -hmm. he said, even like listening to him, he was like, make it like an external problem, like you against the problem. So that's not your mind. And I was like, yeah, like listening to everyone who's gone through it before too, tell their stories is really, really helpful. Yeah, it's so great. As soon as you start talking to people, you realize, oh, I'm not the only one that feels like this. Mm -hmm. That's so great. That's one of the reasons we do this podcast is to help destigmatize mental health and addiction, all these issues that our teenagers are going through so they can feel more able to talk about it without being embarrassed or shamed or uh, feel like something's wrong with them because everybody deals with this stuff, but so few people are talking about it. So I'm grateful that you're talking about it you being on this podcast might encourage some other kid to go, you know what, I should open up to somebody at school or a parent or a trusted relative, and then maybe they'll get the help they need. So Mm -hmm. that's how it works. Yeah. So what is your near future looking like? What's what's happening now? How are you feeling? You're at this new school. Yeah. So I am looking to go into college. I'm still, it's definitely going to be junior college. I definitely want to study music therapy in or I like the prospect of family therapy now too Mm -hmm. I feel like I would enjoy working with them and Mm -hmm. finding solutions with other with people and but I'm also thinking of music therapy too which Mm -hmm. is my first choice I just don't know whether Mm -hmm. to go to psychology or music as my major so (laughs) yeah well luckily for both of those a lot of the same classes will serve you for both directions so when you start off you have to take a bunch of prereqs which would be pretty much the same for both of those majors so you're in good shape Mm -hmm. and you have time to figure it out and you might go one direction for 10 years and go oh I'm going to go a different direction yeah you know I never knew I'd make a podcast, for instance, you know, you just kind of life goes and you just go, okay, let's do this. So it's kind of crazy what we ask 18 year olds to know about their life, you know, know. like, what do you want to do the rest of your life? Ah, Mm -hmm. so you'll, you'll find your path and, you know, you might be a a psychologist that plays the piano or you might be a music therapist that is also a family therapist. You know, you you never know. You might be a... A zookeeper, for all we know. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to do two things. Have family therapy and also music therapy. Like, not just mm-hmm. specialize in one. So, hopefully that can Yeah, work out. you could totally do both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have no doubt. You are so good at school stuff. And um, you're good with people. And you're so talented with your music. And you have a real heart to help other people, which is so great. Mm-hmm. So, any of those kind of helping fields would be awesome for you. Yeah. So, What advice do you have for parents of high school seniors Hmm. or juniors? You know, they're kind of on this cusp of launching out into the world. What can parents do to make sure their kids, I don't know, to keep them safe or to to help them stay sane, safe and or sane? I feel like except that change is going to come. I feel like me and my mom are still really close, but... There's definitely a feeling of more equality in our relationship now that I am mm-hmm. out on my own. And I still mm-hmm. definitely ask her for advice on stuff, but more you have to kind of let your kid live. Mm-hmm. And if you, I don't know, I feel like just let your kid make those decisions, whether they be mm-hmm. good or bad, and find out for themselves because peer pressure is a thing. <laughs> Oh, peer pressure is totally a thing. Yeah. And each kid needs to figure it out for themselves. The parents can't just go around every party with you, right? Right. You can't be there, especially once you go away to school. Then the kids just have to make the choices. The the scary thing nowadays is, you know, the fentanyl and the things that are so dangerous out there. But the, the things that parents can do is to open up the conversation about that and help the, the kids know what is less harmful. Mm -hmm. You know, harm reduction is a a really good tool. You know, if you're going to drink, don't also use drugs at the same time. Yeah. Or if you're going to do this, you know, do it this way. This is the safest mode of using cannabis or whatever. You know, talk those things through with your kids so it's not a taboo subject. Yeah. But give them the tools they need. What do you think about all that? Yeah, I definitely feel like it was a taboo subject for me, especially because I didn't want to be like, 
thought of as, oh my God, she's interested in drugs. Like what? <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. But I wish I would have known more about that, why things were so dangerous, because I mean, like, <laughs> if I had if I had known more, I probably wouldn't have tried anything. But then again, like you're away from home. Yeah. Yeah, without anyone supervising you. And then you're in those choices, you know, I don't want to look like the uncool one. I, I want to be fun and not, you know, it's, it's very tricky. So what do you think about if parents, you know, ran through those scenarios with you, yeah. you know, ahead of time, like, what are you going to do when would that have helped to kind of think through ahead of time what that would look like? Yeah, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I'm looking back in hindsight. I don't know. I think I probably would have. I don't know. But yeah, definitely. I knew to stay away from all of it. Like, I think my parents did the best they could. But Mm -hmm. I think, too, like going over it, what each thing does to your brain a little bit more, Mm -hmm. why you shouldn't do it, Mm -hmm. or telling your kids to really think about the pros and the cons for doing it, Mm -hmm. especially at school. Like for me, the first time I tried something, I didn't have class until one the next day. So I had plenty of time to just kind of okay. like, get it out. Yeah. Right. Cause it might, you don't really know what it's going to do to you, especially the first mm-hmm. time. So yeah, that's, that's very good. Well, I'm glad that you stayed safe and that you kind of learned some lessons mm-hmm. and those life lessons that we all have to learn. I'm not saying like, like that's a bad thing, but like everybody has to just go through and go on their own journey, learning their own lessons along the mm-hmm. way. And I'm glad you have. And it sounds like you now, if somebody has substances, you might be a little more conscious of what your choices yeah. are and not just like, oh, yes, <laughs> give it to me, whatever you got, you know, just put some more, just a little bit more thought to make just because the main thing is, do so we want you to stay safe? Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And some may choose to drink once in a while and that's fine mm-hmm. as long as they're doing it. A safe, lot of people can know? can experiment and nothing ever bad happens. So it's yeah, just keeping safe, keeping your safe self safe in the environment and then just knowing, you know, some of the signs of of addiction, certainly if you keep doing it for a while, that gets kind of scary, mm-hmm. but, and, but just talking about it. So I'm really glad you were able to talk to your mom about it. Mm-hmm. And of course you can talk to me about it and Joey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we know a few things about drugs now, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, but it is a, it's a very treacherous time of life to mm-hmm. try to navigate. So I think you're doing an awesome job, Taylor. Mm-hmm. You are staying afloat. You're getting help. You were able to pivot a couple of times and go, oh, this isn't the right direction. I'm going to go this way instead. Mm -hmm. And that is so amazing. That takes a lot of strength and courage and just fortitude. And I'm just really proud of you. Thank you. you. (laughs) Well, thank you for being on Safe Home Podcast and helping other families. I know you're talking about this. We'll we'll maybe prompt some dinner table conversations tonight (laughs) in some other homes. So I think that's going to be really great. And now, listeners, you're in for a special treat. You are going to hear one of Taylor's original songs called Best of Me. I think it really fits our discussion today. She wrote this song last year and performed it as part of her senior recital. I hope you enjoy the song and then we'll wrap it up after the song. Smile spreads 
its joy like an ocean and what if hello put something in motion and one simple thing can cause the barriers to shatter yeah what if i spoke with the words of compassion and something i said kept the heart from could set us free i'll give you the best in me if one little choice could set us free i'll give you the best in me wow well if you can't tell i'm kind of proud of taylor i think she's doing an amazing job and just an exemplary human being so thank you again taylor for sharing with our podcast audience your story, your unraveling, still developing story. If any of you out there listening would like to support Safe Home Podcast, there's a few ways you can do that. We do have a Patreon account where you can donate either $5, $10, or $25 a month. And it supports the podcast and other activities we do like workshops and speaking and our book club. And we also have a new website called safehomefamilies.com. Go check out all the information on there. There's a lot of resources and upcoming events and things like that. And if you'd like to be on our email list, there's a link to click in the show notes. Thank you everyone for listening to today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed hearing Taylor's story. Taylor and I both want you all to stay stay safe. safe.